Anybody else have a prayer request uh, this morning that you would like to mention? Um, let me see here. Miss. All right. Brewer family. All right. Let's pray for the Brewer. All right, Brewer family. Let's pray for Sue Smith, Miss Loretta's sister there. And uh, again, let's not pray, forget to pray for Miss Nancy uh, Chapman uh, also there. Um, <clears throat> any others this morning? We want to. All right. Okay. Well, let's have uh, Brother Jones. Missed the offering. I uh, missed the microphone duty this morning, but we'll <laughs> guess. <laughs> Like alliteration, your duties are microphone and money. So, <laughs> well, let's ask the Lord to bless this offering and then to bless the Sunday school hour and each of these prayer requests here this morning. Heavenly Father, again, I do ask the Lord you put your hand upon all of these that were mentioned and many more, Lord, in our longer list that you'd please help them. And I pray, God, that you'd please be with them. Others, Lord, going through some hard times. Pray, God, that you'd help them. Uh, Father, unspoken. Burdens that we don't know about. God, I pray you give strength of shoulders and wisdom in each of those situations. Bless, I pray, this offering this morning and our Sunday school hour. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, while he's doing that, <clears throat> oh, let's sing in just a, uh, just a line of this one right here. Um, ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand? Ain't it grand to be a Christian? Ain't it grand? On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all day, Sunday, grand to be a Christian, ain't it grand? Oh, we got to do another one here. Ain't it grand to read your Bible, ain't it grand? Ain't it grand to read your Bible, ain't it grand? On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all day, Sunday, grand to read your Bible, ain't it grand? Amen. Now you wake him up better. <laughs> Oh my! He said uh, he said for me to just step up. Uh, no, uh, but anyway, that that helped me. That kind of exercised my voice a little bit. So that, that was a was a help to me. Turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number twenty-eight. We're in the third part of our series, the biblical path to money and stewardship. And for those listening online, if you'll. Uh, uh, send Brother Dean an email. We'll get you uh, figure out how to get you a copy of the study notes from these. We didn't have one last week. We did for the first week, and so uh, you do that if you're no matter where in the world you're listening from. We'll get you a copy some way. Uh, I didn't plan on having you stand this morning, but let's stand to our feet this morning. Read one verse, Genesis chapter one, verse number twenty-eight. The biblical path to money and stewardship, and this verse doesn't seem to have anything to do with it. <laughs> But you'll see. Uh, Genesis one twenty eight said, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you, as Brother Dean's already mentioned, to be here today, to gather strength from you, Lord, to gather encouragement. Uh, Lord, to get refreshment, and and Lord, to help us in, in the upcoming week that's just begun today, Lord, that we might live for you regardless of the circumstances around us. I pray, Lord, you'd uh, place your hand on Brother Dean for the uh, message for the 11 o'clock today, and, but Lord, give me your words to say, Lord. Work through me. Uh, we need these things. We need these teachings in, in these difficult last days so, Lord, help us all, and, and as I say, Lord, send the message through me during the Sunday school hour. Give us a good day, Lord. May all the singing, all the praising, all the preaching, all the teaching here at Landmark, uh, Lord, we pray that it will glorify you, for it's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. And you can be seated. Now, last week we kind of opened up our study on this thing that we call money. Now, some believe money to be paper currency or digits on a screen, and those are meant to uh, represent uh, the medium of exchange for goods and service, uh, goods and services. But let me suggest to you, though we won't get into this today, that those digits on the screen and that paper currency there is uh, still in use and still giving given 
what we might call value because of a strong government, a strong military, and the grace of Almighty God. And we'll probably get to that in the study. But last week, in the last couple of weeks, we've established and tried to reestablish that everything belongs to God. Everything that you have today that you wore or you drove or you used to put on your nose to see your notes, whatever it is, God owns it all. He's just made us managers, overseers of these things, you see, and we need to get that in our mind. Now, we learned in Genesis 2 that God created gold. Now, let me say to you ahead of the study, gold and silver, that's what the Lord Jesus called by name money. Money, he calls it in the New Testament. We'll get there. And in Genesis 2, we saw that God uh, called the gold good, and he seemed to separate that good from the other precious stones. I believe there's a reason for that. My idea behind that is that's the medium for commerce that he created for man ahead of time to use in commerce. And let me say this, not in my notes, but let me say this. God, uh, God's desire is for us to live communal in a certain sense. And I thought about this as, as I was I wasn't I wasn't mowing the yard the other day when I thought this. I was doing something in my work. I thought about this. You know, you think about the old, uh, let's think for a minute about the old west. Now those were dangerous places to live and rot gut saloons and all that. But think about that. You, you had one person whose vocational specialty was the blacksmith. Remember that? You had a fellow over here that probably wasn't well looked upon, but he was the undertaker. That was his specialty. You had a fellow over here that ran the general store and had the grocery store and all the things you needed. A person, God designed our society to be that way. We have responsibility of our own finances, the things he gives us, the things he owns that we're giving stewardship over. But see, he requires that of us to go out and do business with people who have other vocational specialties and to be smart about it. That's what we call commerce. Well, I believe when he made gold, he was given man in advance the very tool, the very tool that would be used in commerce. Though, Now get this, though God desired, listen to me carefully, God desired for us to be communal in certain things, he didn't design us to be in a one-world government. Now, there's two reasons I say that. Two reasons I say that. Read about Nimrod. <laughs> God says once they, once they start this universal thinking, if you will, they won't stop at anything. Yet, yet, the medium of gold was used in ancient Egypt when Moses was enslaved there. Think about that. He, he gave the same basic medium of exchange to everybody in the world, but didn't, and, and they could to some extent trade with each other. The Bible talks about that with the children of Israel, but he didn't design them to be under a one world government. Do you see? That's, that's how diverse and how exact God is with these things, and we'll see that later on. So God owns everything. Let's get back to that thought. Now we learned that Adam was made in the image of God, the Trinity, and we are a Trinity like Adam. Adam was a Trinity. Body soul and spirit God is the Father Son the Holy Ghost you see that is what it means about made in the image of God and and God said we know Jesus Christ was there in the beginning we know that the Holy Spirit was there in the beginning because he said let us make man in our image you see so we know that and uh, and let me say this to you never forget this first Corinthians 15 45 now those of you on the broadcast or those of you in the house I suggest you have a you already got some paper Okay, I suggest you take a, a pen and scratch down some of these notes, some of these references, look at them on your own. That's important to do because I don't know your finances. <laughs> I don't know your place in life, but we can learn what God said about the principles, then you apply them. But 1 Corinthians fifteen forty five says this concerning uh, Adam. It says, and so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You see... <clears throat> There's a pattern there that was developed by God, and that trinity is reflected there from the first Adam, which was Adam. <laughs> I, know, I know that's hard to figure out. That last Adam is Jesus Christ, you see, uh, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And let me say this to you, an application before we jump in here. Uh, the day, uh, for the, here's an application that was given to you the day you and I were born. Uh, see, it's a fact, so we were born. Remember that pattern last week of the so? 
so, so. It was so. It happened. It was so. But then when the purpose was given and whatever was created uh, started to fulfill its purpose, God given, God saw it was good. That so, so, that good, you see, in being those things. You and I were born physically one day, right? Well, that's so, isn't it? That's fact. But let me say this to you and be very uh, exacting about it. And I'm getting to our study here. We're just reestablishing some of these facts. It was, it's one thing to be so. But it's another thing to find your purpose that God's given you. Carry out that purpose. And you know what he'll say uh, at that point? Write down Matthew 25, 21. If you're, if you're born and that's so, and if you're born again, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's what we. But man, if you do those things and find out God's purpose for your life, then Matthew 25, 21 gives the example on earth of what he'll say in heaven. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful service. Servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. It's one thing to enter in with the Lord after you're born again, right? But let me tell you, it's far better to enter into the joy of the Lord. And that's why we're looking at these, uh, these purposes today, these, these financial, if you will, applications in our life so that we don't have to wait to start pleasing God after we're out of here. <laughs> we can start while we're here, you see, in many things, and we're singling out in our study those things uh, that, uh, that pertain to finances. Look at Genesis 1.27 again. It says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created he then. And then we read verse 28, God blessed them, said be. Now this, is, this is, has to do with our, our financial study today, and I want you to notice this. God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And look over there at your notes under, under that passage where it says, number one, fruitful. And I define these words for you because, listen, we're going to learn a pattern here of God about the purpose of man, and we're going to learn those same basic principles are to be exercised in finance. He's taught it through man, through our purpose. Now, everything in the Bible is not that way, <laughs> but finances greatly reflect man's purpose, and I believe reflects the purpose of being, uh, doing the right things in finances. Fruitful says it's very productive, producing fruit in abundance, an offspring, if you will, as fruitful soil, a fruitful tree, a fruitful season. Now, a lot of times we'll just look at this and the Bible says, well, that has to do with childbearing, doesn't have anything to do with me. But I want you to notice how it's worded in your Bible. They go together, but they're not exact. Notice back in verse 28, be fruitful and multiply. Did you see that? Be fruitful and. Now, God doesn't bless everyone. There's several people even in the house today that don't have kids, including your Sunday school teacher. But let me say something here. We're teaching a basic principle a broad principle, and then we're going to zero in about how these principles concern us in our finances as well. Look at number two there. It says multiply. Now Webster's 8.28 says to increase in number, to make more by natural generation or production or by addition as to multiply men. Now notice Webster said as. See, there can be an application there that doesn't pertain by definition to just children. It says to multiply men, horses, or other animals, and it could be in the negative to multiply evils. Look at number three, replenish, as in replenish the earth. Webster's 1828 says to fill. Now let me say something here. There are people who will confuse you about your King James Bible. I just showed you why you shouldn't be. See, people say that, that since Adam was to replenish the earth, that means to fill again. If you've emptied your first glass of iced tea, so you can tell we're a Baptist church if you're listening in on the broadcast. We used iced tea as an example. Sweet tea, by the way. <laughs> now, some of you might be different. But listen, we think if we refill a glass, it's been filled before. But look what Webster said in the original translation. First definition meant, meant to fill. So don't be buying that baloney that there was this generation that came along and they fell and God wiped them out and then he started all over with Adam. 
You just read, I just told you in the Bible, the Bible says the first Adam. First Adam. Don't be confused about that. This doesn't have to do with finances, I promise. Notice uh, replenish means to fill, to stock with numbers or abundance. The magazines are replenished with corn. The springs are replenished with water. Now let me say this uh, uh, about these things. Uh, I read a good writer who talked about this passage, and he said specifically when it came to man, it meant to take possession of uh, this word replenish. Uh, to till the ground and to make good use of it. Listen to that, to make good use of it. Now think about that. We're going to talk about some application cheer. Uh, these th same principles are all about your finances. Look at subdue. Again, from the Webster's 1828. Let me say this to you once again. The King James Bible is the best translation only because of one reason. Well, there are several, but let me just give you one reason. You know why it is? If you speak English. Now, you might think that you've got some revision or rewritten or some, somebody's idea of a verse, and, well, it's in, it's in the grammar that I use every day. Hey, let's go back to the, to the pure language of English when it was translated. That was in the 1600s. Now, listen, it took man a little while till 1828 to, for, for God to move upon someone to go back and look at every word, give us biblical reasons for the definition. But listen, if you're listening to me today and you don't have a King James Bible, Bible. Let me say this to you. If you go down to your Bible bookstore, you'll say, well, they cost about the same. Go to Dollar Tree. On the King, only the King James costs $1. $1. $1. Well, you know why that is? Because God's the author of that. No one claims a copyright to that, but men claim copyrights to all the other revisions. Now, man should never claim that which belongs to God. Brother Joe, don't get the offering plates. That's free. That was the second message to Dean, Dean at the first. But let me say this, subdue, look at it, number four, to conquer by force or the exertion of superior power, being into permanent subjection, to reduce under dominion. Thus Caesar subdued the Gauls, and uh, Augustus subdued Egypt, the English subdued Canada. I had to think about that when that was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, might be some Canadians listening and take offense to that one. Take it up with Noah Webster. He's in heaven. Subduing implies conquest or vanquishing, but it implies also more permanent of subjection to the conquering of power than either of these words. Now listen, there are four basic principles here, and you just read them about the four basic assignments given to man. Now let's think about the same principles in finance. Are you Are you ready? Number one, in our financial life, we are to be fruitful. Now, in Matthew 25, you've read the parable of the talents, haven't you? Right? It's about an earthly master and earthly servants serving there on his property. Now, let's stop there for just a minute. Isn't that a good example of a great God that owns everything? <laughs> and you and I are laborers here on earth. Isn't that a good example? On his planet. And by the way, these, these servants got, listen to me, his money. That master brought his money to those people. Remember that? You remember it as well. Now what's that have to do with fruitful? Well, I'm glad you asked about that. See, the Bible is teaching us that management is not how much. He didn't give them all the same amount of money. Did you hear me? Now how do I apply that as a believer? There are people who have plenty in abundance of what we call money, which is really currency, and possessions and commodities on earth. And there are other believers that don't have much of anything. It's not how much God gives you. Did you hear me? Matthew 25 proves it. It's not how much he gives you. It's how you manage it. Are you fruitful with it? Do you do what the master says to do with it. Now there was some type of labor or commerce that these in this example in the book of Matthew, uh, what they do in Matthew 25, and we won't go there. But let me say this. They were commended when they gained something. Now this is very important. I hope you'll go home and study this. You, you, you at home listening and I hope you look it up. Did you know God commended the ones who gained little the same as he, as he commended the ones that gained a lot. Fruitful, fruitful. That point, fruitful, fruitful, 
fruitful. Notice that. Number one, we're to be fruitful. I, had, I wrote this down. I had to think about this. <laughs> it made me think of that. Uh, anybody eat uh, 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 Mrs. Stacy's tomatoes this week? Or <laughs> I saw Miss Robin <laughs> nodding yet. Hey, that's an, that's an example in that of being fruitful, is it not? Literally, tomatoes are fruit. Hello. <laughs> what better example could you have? See, it was her labor, her management. That, that encouraged those to grow. It was God's land. It was God's plants. It was, she, was God, she is God's creature. She had God's energy, but she made a choice. She made a choice. That's what it's all about. Now look at multiply. That was in here. Fruitful and multiply. How does, how does that uh, uh, pertain to finances? <clears throat> now let me say this. You already know this. You're going to say, I got up early to hear this. You can't save everything. <laughs> You can you cannot take everything and save everything, but let me say this: I believe there's a portion of our finances, and uh, might not be exactly the same for for those for everyone. That's to be set aside. You know, the Bible says when we're saved, we're sanctified. See how these these uh, these values overlap each other. When we're saved, we're sanctified. What does sanctified mean? It means we're set aside for a special purpose. I believe a portion of our finances are to multiply. They're to be set aside for a special purpose. And I don't believe you can be willy-nilly in that, you see. And, and by the way, we're not even getting to the tithe because that's when people tend to get real uncomfortable. We'll get to that in another lesson and talk about what the Bible says. about. I have to say this to you about tithing. You know, uh, finances and money gets the best of some people, and I know you're saying, no. It gets the best of some You know what I heard a fellow tell me one time? I had no response. I mean, I had several things I wanted to respond, but I just didn't think he would hear me. He says, you know, I'm just not sure about that 10% toward God, that tithe, because somehow I think the 10% was different back in the nation of Israel than it is now, and I went... Okay, tenth. It says a tenth. Ten pieces, ten equal pieces. How could that be different? <laughs> but you see, our minds get all fouled up when we, when we don't concentrate and get our mind on what God said. So we cannot save everything, but we're to be fruitful and we're to multiply. I heard about a businessman who got a call from his accountant, and he was overjoyed. <laughs> that doesn't happen often. I have an accountant. <laughs> It's usually a bill of say here, pay these, this, and write that to that and all that. But he got a call from his accountant. She said, Mr. Smith, I, I went through your books carefully. And I'm happy to tell you that you have enough money to last the rest of your life. And he was overjoyed. He said, Boy, I tell you what, I'll sleep better tonight. <laughs> It's hard to tell what I'll do tomorrow. She said, I, I have noticed you've got enough money to last your entire life, unless, of course, you decide to buy something. So we think about we cannot save everything, can we? We cannot save everything. But let's look at some uh, biblical inferences to multiplying uh, in principle in our finances. Hold your place in Genesis. Go to Proverbs 21. Proverbs chapter number 21. 21. Verse 5, we're to be fruitful, we're to multiply in finances, just like they did in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents. Those, those men in that example, they were diligent about their work. They were diligent about what the master had given them and what he told them to do with it is gain a return. And then they worked and they did the things. To, remember the one, the one who buried it in, in, uh, in the earth? He said, well, here it is, here's your, here's your talent back. <laughs> Here's your, and talent was a weight of silver, of money. That's what the word talent meant. We would think of an ounce in our vernacular today. And remember, God, God didn't pull any punches. That master didn't pull any punches. He said, you're a wicked and slothful servant. See, you, you didn't do anything. See, you, didn't, you weren't fruitful. You didn't multiply. See, those same examples as the four, four, fourfold purpose of man. Now look at Proverbs 21.5. It says, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. Now let me say this, how does that apply to finances? Well, you see, our thoughts to diligence shouldn't necessarily be solely focused on how much we can get back. It's what did God say to do? And see, we'll focus on the amount. Hello? Remember I said it doesn't matter how much you have? We'll focus on the amount. But notice what he goes on to say. But of everyone that is hasty, only to want. See, he's talking about there being fruitful. He's talking about multiplying in finances. And let me say this, the inference is there. Notice everyone that is 
hasty. Did you see that? Hasty. He's teaching you a financial principle there from your own Bible. And, and you can talk to, talk to any financial planner if they have a brain, and they'll tell you this. The way to multiply finances is not fast. It's slow, steady growth. Slow, steady. Look what he said there. Everyone that is hasty will be in want, will be without, you see. Now look at verse 20 of that same uh, verse there. Uh, this, this idea of laying a portion aside with the idea of, of multiplying. Notice what it says in Proverbs 21.20. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man, you're to lay aside some and multiply. You're to be fruitful first and get it the right way, and then you should seek that some would multiply. Now the key words there concerning both stewardship and being fruitful and multiplying is what the Lord gives there. It's to be diligent. Notice there, be diligent, be patient, be wise. Be diligent, be patient, be wise. Look at all of those principles that are under that heading that we're talking about there. Now about replenish, we read a couple of verses uh, last week. Go over to Proverbs 27. Now let's look at this, this idea of replenish. He says, be fruitful, replenish, uh, multiply, you see, and to bring under subjection. And we'll see that in just a little bit there. And, uh, and see that subdue it is the exact verbiage there. So let me say this again, fruitful, multiply, replenish, and subdue. And those are important financial principles that we see in the Bible. <clears throat> in Proverbs 27, verse number 23. Now, we read this last week, but let's think about this principle in the idea of the word replenish. Remember last week I told you that our financial life, as well as most of our life, is like a heartbeat on a monitor. Do you remember that? Up sometimes, middle sometimes, down sometimes, middle sometimes. Do you see the point? Finances tend to go that way, too. You know these things. <laughs> most everyone in here is close to my age, <laughs> one way or the other. You know these things, but look what the Bible says about replenishing here in verse 23. Be thou diligent, verse 23 says, to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. Now notice first the specific example here is herds and flocks. Well, this, is, this goes right along with the multiplying principle, the fruitful principle, and it also goes along with what we're saying about the replenishing now, now, why is this important, and how do I know this? Verse 24, for riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. Now, notice that you're seeing animals here in com as commodities. Now, take the broad view on that, and you're looking at finances this same way, you see. Now, now what does this mean about replenishing? The herdsman must take care of the animals. Number one, he's got to feed them well, doesn't he? He's got to keep the predators away, doesn't he? Hello? Is the light bulb going? He's got to keep the predators away from all these things. He's got to ask Lord, the Lord to give the right offspring. I, you go talk to cattle farmers and sheep farmers and goat farmers, and if they're really, uh, really uh, in that uh, for something besides a hobby, they'll say, boy, I need some, I need some ewe lambs. <laughs> if we're in cattle, boy, I need some heifers born. I, ne I, ne I need a good bull. I need some steers, you know. They'll, we, see, we're asking God there for the right offspring as we go into this thing of replenishing. We must, uh, we must uh, be fruitful in our daily management of those herds he's talking about there. He's got to, re and by the way, remember I said you can't save everything? Let's take the example of a herd. Not all of them are going to live. And, and if... One's doesn't come along to replenish, or if that farmer's unable to go out in commerce and trade for some animals, you see, that, that community we're talking about with each other, you see, then, then you see things are going to get out of balance in these things. But, and, but let me say this is very important. If we manage our side of finances, if you manage your side of the herd, the rest is up to God. But if you don't manage your side, Hello, if we don't manage our side, let me just ask you, how does that turn out? <laughs> Sooner or later, how does that turn out, you see? I hope you see that example of the herd, H-E-R-D, the flocks. But back off of that and say, hey, there's something here that pertains to me in my finances. And that, 
that uh, kind of thing. And, uh, but the idea of replenish here, the same principles hold true for multiplying some of our finances in general or the items used in replenishing finances. Notice how this simple example of the flocks and the herds in the Bible perfectly reflects financial management in our word today. Hey, I, I, and, and I got something out of this that's not obvious to you look at it. You know, people say the Bible's just outdated. Said, well, <laughs> Now, the Bible hadn't told me anything what to do about uh, investing in Wall Street. And you see, the Bible's just outdated. Are you stupid? Wall Street is, listen to me, Wall Street's called the stock market. Here's the biblical example, listen to me, of live stock. Did you get it? It's the same principle. Except, except God's example here doesn't contain corruption and illegal trading and insider trading and that kind of thing. Well, look, look what, you don't believe me, look what Webster said. Look at that uh, at the very bottom where he defines stock. A fund, capital, the money or goods employed in trade, manufacture, insurance, banking. As the stock of a banking company, you're saying, I don't see it yet. The stock employed in the manufacture of cotton in the making of insurance and the like stock can be individual or joint notice it says money lent to government that's now now don't be confused that that was definitions 11 and 12 because stock has a lot of uh, when we say the word stock it has a lot of definitions and sometimes definitions go higher and lower as the English language change. Look, money lent to government or property in public debt, a share or shares of a national or other public debt or in a, uh, a company debt. The United States borrow of the bank or the individuals and sell stock bearing an interest of 5 6 or 7%. See, this example is where you're multiplying your herd. You're being fruitful. You're multiplying. You're replenishing all in this example. Uh, British stocks are the subject of perpetual speculation. See, this is live stock stock that he's talking about here and you saw all those definitions there now look at proverbs 27 26 i want to show you something about the result of being fruitful and multiplying in your finances replenishing uh, it says in those things the diligent servant the wise servant look what look what it says it says the return will be diverse it's right there in your bible didn't you see it verse 26 the lambs are for thy clothing the goats are for the price of the field, and thou have, uh, shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food. Look, clothing, the cost, and the food for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of thy maidens. You see, when we do things God's way, when we're fruitful, when we multiply, when we replenish, we do it all God's way, and we manage our side of those things, you see, there are multitudes of advantages and results in that. Not on everything you have. And no, I'm not telling you, hey, stay with me at the service and I'll come buy some stocks for you. I wouldn't know how. <laughs> I'm talking about a general principle, a general rule here about the way we should be about our finances. Now, you might say I failed in my financial life, made bad decisions, and there's no hope for me, and what if I'm older? <laughs> well, obedience in God can start anywhere, even late in life. And by the way, you can start over. Now, you're thinking, oh, you're going to talk about bankruptcy now. No. I'm talking about starting over with God. Let me, let, me, let me bring in a point here. Let's say you fail in your finances, and you say, well, I've seen this today. I'm convicted. I'm, I'm a failure. No, God didn't invent failures. Failures are events. Listen to me. Failures are events. They're not people. Everybody was created for a fourfold purpose. That's how I know that, including you, <laughs> including me. Uh, but let me ask you this, if, if it were true and you failed in your finances and there was no hope for you to make things right, the same would have to be true for a young girl or a woman that had an abortion because they cannot go and undo that, right? But that's not true. <laughs> let me say this on the broadcast in the house today. Maybe you know someone that had an abortion. Let me tell you, I know from the Bible what you should do. Go, go confess and agree with God. That's what the word repent means. And then go serve God with the rest of your life. That baby's with him. <laughs> that baby is with him. And that's what we should do with our finances. Just admit to God, I, was, I didn't know, Lord. I didn't pay any attention. I was a bad manager. Just agree with God and then start, up, start all over again with God and say, Lord, I can't do anything about those things that's happened. 
uh, but I can uh, do something from this day forward. There's a curious passage, and I hope you write it down, in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. It's a principle that I think we'd be wise to remember when we failed in our financial life, and I'll wrap up here in just a moment. Joel 2, 25, listen to what it says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Let me say this to you today, wherever you're listening from, you failed God in your finances, just, just agree with him and just start all over again. All right, Lord, <laughs> that chapter's gone. And let me say this if in closing today, and, and I know this has been kind of scattered all over the place. I attempted to show you four principles, four purposes God had for man, and then we're to ex exercise those same four purposes. We didn't get to subdue, sorry. We might mention that next week in passing. You don't have to save your handout or your study notes. We'll probably have some more next week, but uh, go look at that word subdue. It means to bring under subjection. It means to bring under subjection. Let me say this to you and be very clear about it. You might never have thought of it this way, okay? Finances are very important here on earth. How we manage our finances is how we manage the other parts of our life most of the time. Finances and, and what we call money has an interesting quality about it. Listen to me close. Everything in life's not this way. Finances will get managed. Did you hear me? The way they get managed is not up to God. It's up to us. Here it is. Either we will subdue and manage our finances or our finances will manage us. Did you hear me? Now let me say that, that I've been learning this process. I'm up here teaching as one of you. I, I'm, I'm happy to go back and get these in my... Let me tell you something. There's nothing that I know of that interferes more with our worship than when other problems in the world are bothering us. Can you agree with that? Could be the death or sickness of someone. Could be a financial thing. Every one of you has probably been through one of those things. You come to church. Boy, it's been so hard for me to humble myself before God. Well, let's, let's purpose ourselves as believers to take care and manage this matter of finances. Wh whether it's going the way we want it to go or not. Take these principles and apply them. And you know what? At the very least, when we come to the house of God, we can be ready to worship. Did you hear me? Now, none of this... Is to This is not some thinly veiled message saying, hey, we want you to give all your money to our church. And I don't believe that baloney that Satan peddles. This is something I think we all need to study. And quite frankly, I don't find this information much of anywhere. Do you from a biblical? I don't. If you do, share it with me. I, listen, I don't have some book I'm preparing this from except for that Bible. That's it. I don't find this teaching much of anywhere, so you pray for us. <laughs> but take these things to heart. They're very important. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the time to come today. And we pray, Lord, that, that something we said, Lord, was the, the principles. And Lord, that help us to teach you these things. These aren't easy to teach. These things aren't easy to learn. But teach me first, Lord, as you've been doing. And may we all learn, and may, may someone be blessed in the house or on the broadcast or wherever it might be, Lord. Give us a good day. Once again, be with the singing and the preaching, Lord, especially, and, and uh, bless us. And all we do, bless those on their way here today, those that are on the broadcast or, or coming on to the broadcast for 11 o'clock. Bless us all, Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen, and you're dismissed.